Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Helen Maria Nugent. I'm the Dean of the Design Division here at California College of the Arts. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the first of seven events in the Spring 2021 Design Lecture Series. Uh, design at CCA is a sanctuary for those with radical curiosity, a place where your wonder and your imagination are amplified through rigorous experimentation and deep craft. Our purpose is to equip makers, thinkers and doers with the wherewithal to envision alternate futures and the creative capacity to deliver generative solutions that inspire change. In partnership with our colleagues in fine arts, architecture and the humanities, we make art and design that matters. The division, as you see on the screen here, hosts six undergraduate programs in fashion, our hosts for tonight, in furniture, graphics, illustration, industrial and interaction design, and at the graduate level, an MFA in design, a low residency MBA in design strategy, and a one-year Master's of Design in interaction design. Our campuses are located in Hui Chin and Yelamu also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of the Chochenyo and Ramayatush Ohlone peoples who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. Uh, CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present and future here and around the world. And we wish to pay our respects to our local elders with this land acknowledgement. The spring lecture series will be presented entirely on Zoom, so join us for future events, just make sure you RSVP. Uh, hopefully you have caught some of our, uh, our future uh, speakers. They are all leading practitioners whose work is reshaping our world. Tonight we will hear from entrepreneur Beth Esplanet, whose company Unspun has reimagined the concept of fit and is challenging the status quo of the retail fashion industry. Um, we have Audrey Liu, who will discuss optimistic, um, uh, her optimism as a driver in her journey to design leadership, and many, many more incredible lectures uh, throughout the semester. A big, big thank you to uh, Chilean graphic designer Alejandra Valenzuela, who is a graduate of our MFA in design program. She created all of our graphics for the series and our brand identity. Uh, she calls this concept, the electricity of the idea, raised dots and stitches representing all sensations and connections generated when creating. We hope you enjoy it. And I'd like to give a really big thanks to all of the design staff working in the background here. Thank you for all you do. Uh, what we're looking at now are just some logistics for this evening. Uh, I want you to uh, take a look and see that you will see a chat and a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please use the Q&A box for your questions that you'd like to ask Beth and use the chat to say hi to each other or um, uh, to engage with one of our staff members. Additionally, we are in beta testing of uh, closed captioning tonight. If you would like to turn that on, you can click on live transcript at the bottom of your screen and available to you there will be the opportunity to select subtitles, to open a full transcript or open on the right hand side of your screen um, or to move or change the size of your subtitles. So uh, we hope they're going to work and we hope that they are as accurate as uh, they can be. Oh yeah, and if you'd like to, if you have a problem, please put it in the chat and one of our staff members will help you with that feature. Uh, so could Beth and Linda turn their videos on, please? Hi, hi, Beth. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm really, really excited for your lecture. And I'd like to introduce all of you also to Linda Gross, who is the chair of the BFA in Fashion. Um, and she's going to be introducing Beth in a second. But first, let me introduce her to you. Linda has 30 years of experience uh, in the fashion and sustainability industry. She co-founded Esprit's e-collection, which was the first ecological clothing line developed by an international corporation. She's the co-founder of the interestingly titled Union of Concerned Researchers in Fashion and is co-author of the book Fashion and Sustainability Design for Change. Linda joined CCA 21 years ago to develop our fashion and sustainability classes, which she has done. And she's currently working on a variety of speculative designs, exploring the wearer's satisfaction of desire through garments designed to evolve over time. 
Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Linda. Thank you so much for sponsoring this event tonight through the Fashion Programme. Um, looking forward to your lecture, Beth, and enjoy the lecture, everyone. Thank you. Hello, Maria. Um, so have you, as you heard, we've been teaching fashion and sustainability at California College of the Arts since 1999. And the founding chair of the program felt that it was a unique point of view that a San Francisco based design program could bring to the world of fashion. And we teach fashion and sustainability based on the principles of ecology and the intention for humans and all other species to flourish within the finite limits of nature. So though our students learn about the impacts of textiles, their design decisions and about waste in the fashion industry, they also really understand the limits of designing for sustainability in a culture of conspicuous production and consumption. Hence our extreme excitement at hosting Beth Espinette from Unspun tonight. Um, Beth's interest is in circularity and inclusivity for the fashion industry. She believes in the transformative power of fashion as an art and as a tool, but she thinks that the industry has become unintentional and short-sighted. She has a background that bridges the fields of clothing, product design and manufacturing. She has a BS in fiber science and apparel design from Cornell and an MFA in design from Stanford. She spent time at Pearl Izumi, Mountain Hardware, and Exobionics and was a product design professor at the University of Oregon before pursuing Unspun in 2017. Beth works at the intersection of product, software and hardware. You can see why she's perfect um, for CCA. She will give examples of the customer experience with custom fit jeans and will also give us a hint at what is to come. So please join me in welcoming Beth, Beth Espinet. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you, Helen Maria. Um, thank you everyone at CCA and especially to the fashion design department. Um, this is great to be here. Um, I, I wish I were in the same room as you all, but it's still, it's nice and convenient to be calling from home. Um, I'm calling from the Ohlone territory. I love, I love that you have um, the indigenous map um, in a lot of your materials. And, and so I was very curious and, and I'm over in Berkeley, so I'm in the Ohlone area and I, I really appreciate that. Um, something that I wanna mention before I dive in is that I have, I'm going to try to have the chat open. So if anyone is interested in, in putting comments, asking questions, please, um, please put on all panelists or direct it at me and, and send something in the chat. Um, what I love about it versus like being in person is when you're in person, you can't just, you know, yell something randomly, but when with this chat, it's sort of like you can just yell in the in the middle of when someone's talking and it's not like they're they're being interrupted. So I would encourage you to uh, use that if you can. So I'm going to share my screen with you all. And I really wanted to give you a, a behind the scenes look at what, what Unspun is, what it has been in the past and, and what's to come. Um, as a lot of you are designers, a lot of you go to CCA, it's a lot of creativity um, in this metaphorical room here. And so I imagine that you know, you're curious about behind the scenes of, of any given thing and, and your, the creative process is, is probably interesting. So. Um, that's why I wanted to really, you know, bring bring that up and and share that with you today. Okay, so I have the chat up. Great. So Unspun has been around for let's see five ish years now. I say ish because a lot of these things happen. They kind of trickle. Like you have a, a seed planted in your head, and you kind of collect ideas on how you could make something happen. So officially on paper, it started five years ago. 
um, you, when you have to incorporate a company so that any money you take or th things that you do, you're not personally liable for. That was that was five years ago, but it's been an ongoing collection of, of inspiration um, over almost the last 10 years. So it really started with an image that I'm sure a lot of you have, have probably seen before, and that's just piles of clothing and stuff. And we, we dump, as humans, we dump an entire garbage truck of clothing into the landfill every single second. So garbage truck, garbage truck, like it's insane how much we're, we're throwing away. And this became front and center for me, not during school, um, but after school. I, I imagine that CCA is, is very good at, about informing you of what the real world is like. But when I was in school, it was very glamorous. It was like, let's, let's uh, design more evening gowns. And then I got out of school and found that it wasn't quite, <laughs> quite as glamorous on the other side of the industry as I had hoped. Um, instead, I found a mismatch between what we were producing and what people actually wanted to buy um, was finding that we would have to design something and then uh, pass it, you know, you'd have your, your product line manager decide what the, the products would be for the season. The designers would sketch it out, they'd hand it to the developers, the developers would work with the factory back and forth to make it happen. And then um, they would work with them, the planners and the, the forecasters to figure out how much of that product to make. And if they decided that they wouldn't sell enough of something, they would never produce it to begin with. But if they hit that, that threshold of you know, that economy of scale, then they would produce it. But it would have to be in the hundreds of thousands. It was kind of crazy how big of orders we were putting in. And this is all before, before anyone's to, going to buy anything. So it's complete guess and check. Uh, last year was a very, very, like it, the industry has known this has been a problem for a while, but 2020 really uh, made it clear because you had this thing that happened without a pandemic and everyone's stuck at home and they're not buying clothing the, the way that they normally would. So, so much of the, the product has gone to waste. In a normal year, uh, we hear that about 30% of the product that we make um, is just excess inventory. Like it's, it never sells. I have a feeling that last year was a lot more. It's impossible really to get that exact number because so many, it's not in a company's best interest to disclose that number. So you really have to like prod and prod, but those are kind of the estimates that, that people um, imagine the numbers are. So seeing these problems on, we're making too much stuff paired with the stuff that we make people aren't always happy with. It's like, wh why is this a problem? The problem is that we make the product before people want it. So the question kind of became, um, I'm gonna skip ahead and then go back. How, you know, how can we make product on demand? How can we build an industry um, that's, that's holistic and circular? And the reason that we really need a more circular industry is this is, what, this is what the clothing industry looks like right now. This is what the life of any product we, we create, this is what it looks like. So these numbers are from the Qantas report in 2018. They're basically looking at, you know, a, at the products and clothing um, over a year, what are the gigatons of CO2 that are emitted into the atmosphere? And these numbers right here are the gigatons. Um, and then this is the total uh, four point or about almost four gigatons of CO2 emitted per year. That's um, about a tenth of all human um, emissions. So it's it's kind of insane how much emissions are attributed to um, clothing, but that's that's only looking at emissions. We also look at the amount of waste and the amount of pollution, which is out of out of control as well. So seeing this is, this is just really disappointing to think that, you know, we spend so much time on like the glamorous side of the clothing industry. Like let's, let's make this beautiful thing and let's build up the hype and let's sell it. But this is what happens to it at the end of the day. So I think that's what really inspired Unspun. It was like, there's, there's something here. Okay, <laughs> so this is where it starts, where I'm showing you behind the scenes where I start to get a little embarrassed, but I'm going to um, 
I'm going to dive into it anyway. This is not by any means like any, this is not associated with Unspun. It's sort of what led to it. Um, so the, going back to that question, how can we build on demand? It, kind of, it, it comes down to like, is there a way to do this in an automated fashion so that we can, so that we can customize for people? And is there a way that we can build additively so there's no waste in the process? Because right now when we, we cut and sew product, it's about 10% um, of the product of the materials. So if you have a, a woven product specifically, and I'm thinking about jeans because that's what we sell today, but about 10% of the fabric that you lay out, you cut the pattern, about 10% of that goes to waste. There are ways to recycle it, but recycling <laughs> is a misnomer these days. It's really, really difficult to actually recycle. It's often downcycling. And that's something that a lot of companies, a lot of great companies are, are working on and hopefully will unlock over the next 10 years. Okay, so these projects were thinking about thinking about 3D printers and also thinking about growth in nature, how, how things are built up um, in order to realize them. And that's something that the a lot of products and that we've made and and just actually a lot of manufacturing in general does not work in this principle. It works on subtractive manufacturing where you have a, a material and you whittle it away into something else, something smaller. And that's that's how most things are, are made, including uh, clothing. We usually lay out a piece of fabric, cut it up and restitch it together. So we're thinking about how can we how can we do this additively? Because one amazing thing about additive manufacturing is you can build and you have no um, excess, you have no waste. Another cool thing is that because it's being built from, from uh, nothing into something, um, you can think about every single product or every single outcome, if you will, being different. So everything is unique. You can also think about things having a little bit more customization um, when it comes to like what is on the product. So, so for example, going back to a pair of jeans, when you lay out a piece of denim, the denim is pretty much homogenous throughout. Like it's the same twill um, pattern for the fabric. But if you were to build that same thing straight from a material in 3D, you can start to think about specific customization for each part of of the garment because you know where what that is as you're building it. Like, you know, that's the knee, you know, that's the hip. So enough, enough on this page, but um, this was a kind of a, an experimentation with, you know, what we could, what we could do with additive. So like these things on the top are all hot glue, uh, which I'm hoping a few people appreciate because it's a little bit silly, but it was kind of fun to experiment with. So this middle one was um, using water layers as support and then building the hot glue around it. And then these are shoes. I actually brought these to a farmer's market with, with a team of people and we asked people to try it on just to test it out. Like that's something that we've been doing at Unspun since day one. How can we get this out into the market and test it? Um, and really, yeah, really get reactions because that's important. Okay. So from there, we took kind of a big leap. We said, this is interesting to this additive manufacturing thing. It's kind of cool to think about it from the perspective of 3D printing, but 3D printing is not there yet. It's more 3D printing is very much still in the you know chain mail, like plastic chain mail kind of stage. And we're not, people aren't ready. I'm not ready for sure to wear little pieces of plastic for clothing. So we said, let's use yarn, what's wrong with yarn? Yarn is amazing and um, yarn can get the job done. So how can we build additively with yarn? Um, that's what inspired some of these, these machines, these little, um, yeah, this, what was this one? This one was like the spider and the, we had like the hamster wheel. They, we had um, some really interesting machines and we had to, well, we, we decided to start with pipe cleaners and foam and just really start basic. Um, it's 
when designing machines, which I, I've never been trained for, but like I've learned about how fabric is made um, through school. Uh, when, when thinking about this, it's very easy to make all the pieces work in your head. Like, oh yeah, this mechanism does this. And, but when you really get out to the world and you try to do it, it's there's something will literally run into something else that you didn't imagine. So it's really helpful to just test it, just try making prototypes. And um, yeah, if any, anyone in, in design school knows that prototyping and iterating is, is definitely the way to go. So that's, that's what we did here. And again, answering that question, how can we build on demand? This is something that we're still, like these machines are something we're still working on. Um, we have a machine, a couple of machines actually in San Francisco that we're building um, to be able to build on demand. And I'll show you a, an image in a few minutes of what our, our recent prototype, the, the machine prototype plus the actual output prototype looks like, but we're very, very excited for that this year. Okay, so this is where, and this is like at this point, we, we had tested with glue. This is before the company exists. I had tested with glue um, as part of you know, my master's program, had started building some of these machines just to see how the mechanisms, me mechanisms work. And then I graduated and I said, there's no way I can do this alone. Um, I have the design side, but it would be amazing if I could find partners, business partners who are strong in engineering and business, because I feel like that those are gonna be necessary things um, for this company. So that's when Walden and Kevin joined me, both or each of them representing uh, business and engineering. And the three of us said, okay, we have this concept for being able to build product on demand. We can start to answer these questions for um, matching what people want with what we make but what are we going to start with? What's our, what's our go to market? Like, how do we get this into the world? And what's our kind of MVP? So we, how many people, we talked to 400 people just to get a sense of where their interests are for products and specifically where their pain points are for fit. And 300 of those 400 people without soliciting any particular type of product or body type part or anything like that, all brought up denim jeans as the pain point for fit. My hypothesis was that bras was going to come out as number one, um, but I think only three, two thirds of the women that we talked to brought up bras. So it was like, all right, we, we have to go after denim. Jean fit is really hard, but if we can nail jean fit, we could do anything. So that's, that's when we really started to focus. This was three years ago. And that's when 3D body scanning came into the equation. Cause we said, well, we're working on this machine but how are we gonna get custom fit? So we had 3D body scanning and our body scanner was in person. Um, and this is again, kind of embarrassing images but just to show you, you know, how things start, this was uh, an, uh, one of the first body scans that we did. And, you know, this was like very manually, we were making patterns for people. Um, at this point, our pattern making is through algorithms, through machine learning, it's very fast. Um, but at the, at the time, I think it was taking us, I think it took like four hours per person to cr create a custom fit product, but it, and I, we probably only had like a 60% success rate at the beginning. And now we're well over 90%. So um, you can make a lot of progress, but you have to start somewhere. Oops, let me get this dark. So this was our very first, again, starting somewhere. We, I think two, one to three, one, between one and three months in, we started selling. We, we weren't completely confident, but we knew that uh, we could guarantee really good customer service because we wanted to learn. We wanted to get the product on people who were willing to try it. And then if they weren't happy with it, we would just keep making it till they were happy. And that was really important for us in getting it right. Like if we hadn't been willing to start that early, I don't think we would know what we currently do. 
So this <laughs> was our very first pop-up. It's a 10 foot by 10 foot space and it was in Hong Kong. The reason it was in Hong Kong is because we were working on our machine, some of that hardware that you saw in Shenzhen, China. And we felt like, you know, maybe Shenzhen wasn't the right place to do a pop-up, but Hong Kong was right across the border. Let's go there. We have a, <laughs> we have a mirror in the back of the room just because the room was so frighteningly small that we needed to like have something to make it look approachable. And then right here, it was our first, the first body scanner we used. Uh, it was a Fit 3D and it's used for gyms. So it's a little intimidating. It's like got that like tough gym feel. Um, we don't use those ones anymore, but they had really great results and um, we're, we're able to get, you know, after a couple of tries, get some really great fit out of, out of that. We learned so much of this. I think we had a hundred people come through on the first week. Um, yeah, had a lot of fun. So then we said, okay, we did that. Let's try. I think it was a month later, we got out and tried <laughs> a truck. In retrospect, I can see why it didn't work as well as, <laughs> as the, the pop-up. So this truck, um, we would drive around Hong Kong. We, we would sit in here, use this transparent side. This is the body scanner here. And then the fabric rolls on the, on the wall. So customers would come in, they would choose what fabric they wanted, what thread color, what style. I think we had, yeah, we had styles back then and how high the rise would be and how long the hem would be. And this was kind of like, we had no, we had no way of showing people what they were getting. It was just kind of hand wavy. I don't think we even had, maybe we had a drawing. I think we had a drawing of what the, the three styles were. And I don't know, people were just so excited, hadn't seen anything like this before that they were willing to do it. Um, and I think the, the biggest mistake we made, which was more of a learning point and was absolutely worth it in the end, was someone begging for the tightest fit in the most rigid fabric. And we just kept saying, you know, that's not gonna be comfortable. You might not be able to move. And sure enough, when they got them, they could not bend over. So we definitely were like, yeah, maybe we really should have certain uh, certain ways we push people and, and maybe they don't always know exactly what's best for them. So we're still, I think we're still figuring that out. Like how much freedom do you give people? Um, and that's, yeah, absolutely some, something we're still working on but a ton of fun to, to um, launch this truck. And it's actually, this truck is what got us our collaboration with H&M and with Weekday. So I would say it was worth it. Yeah, absolutely worth it. Okay, so this is down the street from you all. This is um, 16th and Doharo in San Francisco and Potrero Hill. So ju just across the border from the design district. And this was an old dry cleaner. This is, so we were, this was a year later, not even a year later, we moved back to San Francisco. And we said, let's get, let's get a retail store. We don't have a lot of money, but we'll, we'll get an office and, and put in a retail store and just see, see um, what kind of interest we can get out of it. So if you look up the stairs here, up in this little mezzanine, that's where our office is and was. There, not, there are only a couple of people in there now because of COVID, but um, we used to have, before COVID, we would have like 15 people up there. Um, it was really fun. And then down here became, I'll show you in the next image, became the uh, retail store. So a customer comes in, they, they actually can still come in. It's just, we, we have appointments now for, for um, during COVID. Come in, they get, they order the same kind of options between the style, the fabric, the thread, the rise height and the hem length. Um, sometimes it's it's tricky to like work through that because let's say that um, you're someone who's like very tall and you're used to buying like a rolled length pant in order to get it to hit at the right place. People are just like, once they kind of place themselves, they like categorize them, themselves as something then it's hard to kind of pull them out of that. So that person would come in and say, oh, I want the rolled hem because I know that's gonna hit me at the right place. And then we'd make it for them and it actually is a rolled hem for them because that's just like how it works. It's just about you and it's just about running, you know, your body scan through the algorithms and it doesn't have any like preconceived notions of what 
it has to be. I mean, of course, it has guidelines on what a gene would be, but it doesn't say, you know, it's sh your inseam should be X length. So I think that's um, something we're always working on is like, this is a new kind of process. How do you how do you help people through it? Um, yeah, so this, this has been a lot of fun. I think you can't see it here, but on the back wall to the right here is our body scanner. So we built out a full room body scanner. It's a little different than the one I just showed. It's, it's more of a frame, but the same concept that you're using infrared to get a full, like a full body picture. And if anyone has ever body scanned before, I'd love to hear if you want to write about it in the notes, um, I'd love to hear about the experience. Okay, so this is a video. I don't think the sound is going to play, but I don't think that matters. Um, of what the process, or, or you know, what we're what we're trying to go after today. So I think I can talk over it, potentially. Yeah. So we did a recent collaboration. This is kind of jumping ahead to to where we are now, and I want to talk about like the tech that's available, the product that's available. But we did, um, is this with six? I don't think so. Um, we, oh, I, I see what you're saying. No, 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 that's not with six. So we did a collaboration with a couple of startups. One is called Resortex, one's called Eon. So Resortex makes dissolvable, what they call dissolvable thread. It's basically a thread that, that melts at a certain temperature. So there's a thread there so that you can more easily recycle what you're making. Cause that's a, a difficult thing. Uh, when, when you're trying to recycle a product, you have to have someone like manually taking it apart in order to, to reuse the materials. Um, doesn't mean it completely solves uh, recycling. Like there's, there's still a lot of other issues, but it's an amazing um, new thing to have. And then Eon is an IOT company that's trying to increase the traceability of a product. So you have an RFID or some kind of QR code on your products, you scan it, you, you get to see with some kind of blockchain, some, something that you can follow, you get to see where the process, like where the product had come from. <laughs> yes, you should absolutely put that in, in everything. I think, so for us, um, we love Resort Text Thread. And what's funny is, um, oops, play again. What's funny is it's actually, you can see it in this image. It's our white thread. That's the Resortex thread. And we're trying to get it in other colors as well. They're, they're currently developing that at the moment. They don't have those options. But we find out that a lot of people order it for the look of the, it's just a very like fresh new kind of looking gene. Um, not, not as many people are ordering it for the, the actual uh, usability, the, the eventual uh, recyclability, but because we don't we don't think about that when we're we're purchasing things. But I wanted to show you this slide. This is what how people purchase jeans at Unspun right now. They get to choose the so you first choose the style. So this is the widest style, and then you choose the fabric, the thread, um, how high you want the rise to be. So we can go low, mid high rise, ultra high rise, and then where you want the cuff to be. So this one's a cropped cuff, so it's a little short, but then you could have a default or rolled. And those all, like all of this, um, along with your body scan, basically gets put through our algorithms. And our algorithms at first, so the very beginning, we were using basically computational geometry, wrapping people in 3D kind of to, under, to get their um, pattern. And then we decided to move to, to algorithms that could do that without us manually working in CAD and working in software to do that. And then now, I think it was about a year ago, we launched our machine learning. So what that does is it, it uses both the algorithms and what we've learned from what people's preferences are. Like basically our, our algorithms are great for academic fit. Like we're gonna give someone a pant, we'll say those will fit you really well. And then they'll come back and say, yeah, they, I think they fit, but I usually like to be, you know, cinched up in the waist more, or I like for things to be a little longer. People have their own preferences and it might not align with what we call fit. It's, it's a little tricky. So we've been able to try to 
try to like make people happier, make sure that they end up with the right product by incorporating any learnings that we've gotten over time into our machine learning. So it's, I don't think we'll ever, because of the preference thing, it's going to be really hard to hit 100% success. I think we will be able to do it when we do virtual try on and people will like, they'll be able to see themselves in 360, which will be really cool. Like when you go to, go to a store to try something on, you can see yourself in a mirror and it's almost like third person, but it's really not because you're not going to see, you're not going to be able to back away from yourself and see yourself from other angles. But with online virtual try on, you will. And so you might actually make more informed decisions about the products you're getting because of that. Um, I think the, the thing that will be missing is just the, the feel of it. Is it, is it exactly the, the, the fabric that you imagined when, when you put it on? That's kind of the trickiest thing. And that's the reason why I think 100% um, is going to be really hard to get. But I think in the high 90s will be very, very doable. So I just want to show you this is where we are today because there are still limitations to this. When someone chooses their fabric, it will change on the image, um, but it's still the same model. And um, I think we, well, I know that we don't have all the rise and crop thing. Like they don't change when you change, when you change them here. And the reason is that we would have to make hundreds, like close to a thousand different pairs of pants if we were to get all these combinations. It's just a lot of combinations if, if you really play it out. So instead, what we're working on right now, because we're a very virtual digital company, we've, we're building what we're calling a customizer. So this is a GIF of, of what that looks like. And you see, can see that um, there are different options of fabrics are being chosen. They're changing the, the huff, the, huff, the cuff, um, length and they're they're changing the different options and you can see it happening um, in real time as you as you choose so we're really excited to be launching this i think in about two months uh, we're about halfway through developing them but it, it means you have to render almost a thousand different <laughs> different pairs of pants uh, on the computer and I'm sure a lot of you have done this before. You know that it's, it's time consuming to make a garment. Imagine making almost a thousand of them. Uh, it's, it's something that we've, one of my teammates is very, very focused on and she just can pump a lot out, but she also has help from our software team and they've written scripts to kind of help us change out threads, change out things that are a lot easier so that we can get all those there. But this is gonna be great for people to be able to see the product they're getting. The, the next step beyond this would be not only seeing the product you're getting, but also seeing exactly that product on you. That's, a, that's gonna be much trickier because you would need to do your body scan. That would need to be uploaded on the computer. And then in real time, it would need to render that pant on you. And so that would take, at least by computing um, times right now, probably half an hour just to make that happen. But we'd have to write a bunch of scripts to, to make it actually doable. And I don't know, we haven't tested it yet, but to see if people will willing, be willing to wait half an hour. Maybe, maybe it would be, I don't know if anyone has any comments, um, please feel free to say if you would be willing to wait half an hour to see something fit on you, but maybe it would be that you would, you would put, put it here, type your email and we'd send it to you later. Um, we really haven't worked that quite out yet, but I think that would be pretty exciting. Okay, so this is the process. You design your fit, then you get your body scan, or yeah, you do your body scan, and you get your jeans. What's different here um, from what I showed previously was the previous scans were in store. So you had your physical body scan. Um, this one is now on your phone. Um, half an hour. Okay, great. That's good to hear. <laughs> Amy, we'll let you know when, when we have it out. Um, so yeah, the, the body scan is now available on phones. We're really excited about it. This is something that was expedited because of COVID. As you can imagine, we had to sh shut down our store in uh, March of last year. Very understandable where we were, you know, to try to get over the pandemic, we we're very happy to do it. Um, but we had no sales. We only had repeat customers over the time that we were closed. Um, so we 
we said we have to get we have to get body scanning of the two people in some way. So we over six weeks worked with a company called In Three D to to get this um, hooked up with all of our processes. And so now um, this is available for people at their homes. The the tech itself is awesome. It works so well. We're really excited about the scans that we get because um, we need a really, it's, what do they say, garbage in, garbage out. You need really good data to, to get a good fitting pair of pants. And so we're really happy with that. Something that we're working on in at the moment is how to tie this all together, how to make it really cohesive experience for our customers. And so we're actually going to be um, launching an app in we're launching in two weeks. I'm really excited about that. It's gonna be a soft launch um, on, on test flight. I don't know if anyone here uses test flight, but it's one of Apple's, um, like it's like a pre-release pre kind of thing for apps. So you can test it out before you launch it big time. So we're gonna do that on the 15th. If anyone here is interested in being part of the beta test for that app, please email me, I'll, I'll put my email on a, a, my, my email's on the slide at the end. So would love to hear from you and get your feedback. Um, it's gonna be great to kind of pull everything together so that customers know exactly what they're going through. But um, again, it might not be perfect. It's our, it's our first launch of the app. Okay. So I mentioned that we, like you've seen some of what our brand does on Spun, but we also collaborate. This year we have, about three really exciting collaborations that are going to happen. I can't, like legally, I said that I can't say anything about it. So I can't tell you yet, but um, there, there are some, some big names that um, we're excited about. So last year in November, yes, November 1st, we launched with uh, one of H&M's brands called Weekday. Weekday, I'd be very curious to hear if anyone's heard of Weekday. If you're from Europe, you probably have. If you're not from Europe, chances are you haven't. But it's a, it's kind of, oh, nice. Okay. Are you from Europe though? <laughs> probably. Um, okay, perfect. Yes. So, so Weekday is headquartered in Stockholm. Uh, and so that makes sense that you know them from Sweden. We, we love what they, what they do. They're just a very like, I, I don't know. I consider them to be like a pretty, up and coming but hip, maybe not even up and coming. They're pretty well established now, like especially in Sweden and across Europe, but they're kind of like a Levi's, but maybe like edgier um, in Europe. And um, they're much higher, like the price points are much higher than you would find at H&M. They care more about, you know, what their what their products are made from and, and where they'll, they'll end up. So what we did with, with Weekday, is the same thing that we have done with our own brand. They gave us a few styles. Um, they basically said, here are all our tech packs, here are our spec sheets, here are the model measurements, here are our patterns, um, figure out how to make these things into an algorithm that, so that when someone goes through a body scan, they can have that particular style uh, made in their shape. Like they're, it's not size, like we, th we threw sizes out the window because Sizes were just a thing that were, was created so that we could cookie cutter very efficiently make product. But we're now at a turning point where tech was making it so easy that we can efficiently, we can efficiently and more affordably make custom for people. So we might as well because um, then it allows us to not make excess. It only you know we're only making for what people want. So we're again making for kind of someone's shape. And they go through the same process at their store as people at, at the Unspun store, but they get a little bit of a bonus because we also built um, almost a virtual try-on. So I mentioned earlier here that, that the customizer um, changes based on what people are, are choosing here and that eventually we'll do virtual try-on. What we did for a weekday was we said, customer scans first, and then once they scan, they get matched to the closest avatar uh, of, of about 30 avatars. And then when they, when they choose their pant, 
then you can see that av like that avatar being dressed in that pant. So it's almost like real time. It's almost like it's on you, but it, it's just um, a little bit more generic. And actually something we've found is maybe that's better. Like maybe people don't want to see themselves exactly, but they want to see something that's pretty close. Um, it really depends on the, the person. We find that very generally athletes are pretty happy to see themselves. I guess, you know, athletes are pretty happy with their bodies or just comfortable, I guess, um, versus like the rest of the population that maybe doesn't, they don't want to see themselves, but it really, it really is a case by case kind of thing. So yeah, we launched with them in November, which was kind of the height of the pandemic. It was very tricky to launch during that time, but we're, we're still going. We, we have, I think it's 10 slots per day that customers can sign up for um, in the store. And they have to use, they have to follow all the, all the guidelines and make sure they're being safe, but I'm still excited. We're still very excited that they've decided to launch it um, despite the pandemic. All right, so here's, just want to show you an image of, of how cool, how, how close renderings are getting these days. So this model above is, she's real. I know it's hard to tell these days whether someone's real or not real. She is real, this is a real picture. And then the images below are her pants. This is the, the slim fit, her pants rendered on her body um, on the computer. And it's just really impressive. Like the lighting is a little different, you can see. So there's not like the shadow here, but I would say it's pretty close. Like maybe you get a little extra in the back here a little bit more bunting there, but it's hard otherwise to kind of see the difference. Um, yeah, this would be like the biggest area um, where it, see it's like maybe bunching on her knee there and versus her ankle here. But um, we've been very excited about what possibilities there are for, for digital design. Okay, so at the very beginning, I talked about how are we doing for time? Oh, okay, I should start closing up soon. But at the very beginning, um, we talked about the machines and how we can build on demand. And that's something we're tying together this year. This year, we're going to be connecting the dots between custom fit and actually producing for someone on our 3D weaving machine. So we've, to this point, created some prototypes. Um, you can see Annika holding a prototype here of our first pants to come off the machine. Those are using like a very generic, um, not very exciting polyester that we just had in the machine, but we're very excited this year to, well, actually in the next week or so to be choosing the yarn that our, our first commercializable products will, will be made from. And the idea is to have them actually be custom, um, that you can, you can change the cross section of the weave um, as you build it. So, this, uh, yeah, this we're very excited for uh, launching this year as well. And I appreciate that everyone has, uh, has allowed me to go over time. I hope that's been okay. And I'd be happy to answer um, these questions as well. Um, but Linda, I, I wanna hand it back to you. Yes, um, thank you, Beth. Absolutely fascinating. I have lots of questions that I would like to ask, but I will. Um, I'll go to our uh, people in the audience first. Um, earlier on, there was a question about when you were talking actually about carbon emissions, there was a question from Joan asking if you take into consideration water, water mm -hmm. use at all. Is that part of your calculations? Yeah, so absolutely. Water, especially with genes, it's what, 10,000 liters per gene roughly that gets used. That's that's really looking at the full from growing the cotton to, to dyeing and cleaning the, the yarn um, and then washing, of course, doing all the distressing at the end. So there ends up being a lot of water use throughout. Um, we So one way that we address, like we address those in different ways. So for the first two, so looking at like the amount of water that's used in growing our, our hope, and this is something that I, I didn't really show, is that we are, will be able to make this circular. And the way that we're aiming to do this is through, through this 3D weaving, the idea that we can go back to the yarn stage again. 
This is something we've only um, created proof of concepts for. It's still very early stage. But if we're able to do it, then we can reuse the areas where a lot of water has been um, used already. So um, in fiber production, in, the, in prepping the yarn, and especially in the dyeing and finishing. So these numbers don't correspond to water. These correspond to carbon emissions, but they are very high for these things as well. So if you have that material already and you reuse it, you don't have to do those processes over again. So that would be an ideal um, use case for making sure to get rid of the, the water. Um, but then also in terms of like finishing the gar the the actual product. We, we use Tonello machines for, for all of our washes. Uh, we, we took, I think we went a year and a half without using, all of our jeans were rinsed. Like we would rinse the fabric ahead of time. And uh, that was pretty much it. And we, so it, they all looked very raw, but we, we rinsed it in order to try to reduce the shrinkage. Um, I saw a question earlier about shrinkage. So, so yes, we're trying to reduce shrinkage in the actual um, fabric, but of course there's still shrinkage in the construction of the, the sewing. So we do apply that to our patterns. So we have to, every, for every fabric and every um, like wash method. So if you have a wash method used on a particular fabric and style, then the, then the um, pattern has to change accordingly. So it's, that's the same thing that they do in the industry. So um, yeah, we're, we're still doing that. But to go back to your question, we're using Tonello machines so we can avoid water use in, in the washing step um, mm. between sewing and, and customer. Great, thank you, Beth. Um, what, uh, another question that came up was related to a question I had as well. Um, can you use selvage denim um, in your jeans. And one of the questions I have, if you're doing circular, literally circular woven zero waste um, techniques, you know, there's certain coding in denim and, you know, and part of the coding is the way that the seams are made and stitched at the side. And do you lose some of that essence of what denim is with this new technology or, and if not, how do you maintain it, including salvage denim? Yeah, so so to answer the first question about selvage denim, we I think actually our first, yeah, our first jeans that we sold were selvage. And yeah, I think there's something beautiful. I mean, a lot of people think there's something beautiful about selvage that you retain that that clean finished edge. Um, we haven't brought it back though. We we haven't had like a request for that kind of style. And it ends up being a little bit trickier for our for our production to to handle it. It would just be a matter. It is possible. It would just be a matter of us um, changing our patterns or releasing a style that has a straight edge on the side. That it's it would be. I would say as simple as that. But it's it's much simpler actually on the patterning side to to do because you would just say like in the code that you would that you would have your, your curves and then maybe you would correct for it and you'd have like a straight edge afterwards so that they could then line that up in production. But I think the harder part would be production because every single pair of um, pants that we're creating becomes its own layer of fabric because they're all unique. And so it would just end up being a pretty expensive pant to like have to line that up individually versus what they do in production now and, and kind of stacking it up. But I love the question. And honestly, I haven't gotten that question in like a year and a half. So I'm gonna write that down. Maybe Selvage is coming back. <laughs> and then you had another question. Um, oh, about the genes. Yes, oh my gosh. Yeah, does this the essence of that, a gene, yeah. yeah. You know, genes are more than just denim, they're more than just blue, you know? And how do you maintain those? recognizable features of a gene with your yeah, this is a tough question we're not we're actually not calling our the products coming off of our machine genes because uh, because they're they're going to be their own thing like they're going to be a different kind of product our one of our advisors um jonathan chung he's a he was a previous head of design at, at levi's he's like i love what you guys are doing with the 3d weaving but you just can't call those genes because they're not going to be genes. Genes are defined by 
their seams and there's there's something there that you guys are going to be missing so he you know he and the rest of us want to celebrate the fact that they're just they're going to be pants they're going to be seamless pants and we can what we can do is incorporate maybe really high denier yarns in like the areas where you might find a seam to get kind of that seam effect but maybe maybe we don't want that like why why do we want is is mm -hmm. there something yes there is something special about seams but um yeah i i think there's a lot to explore with with uh how we how we ex experiment and kind of celebrate that there are none good comeback <laughs> I mean, why would it reference something older or, yeah, so um, that remains to be seen yeah, about the, what people's expectations are and what they accept and so on. Really interesting. I think a um, terrible analogy that we always use is Pringles. Like Pringles came out and they were like, we're a better potato chip. And everyone's like, you're not potato chips. Like you're, you're your own thing. Just, you know, own it. You're Pringles. So I hate to compare us to Pringles, but, you know, that's kind of a... Yeah comparison yeah. we've had no great great point um in the absence of uh more questions coming up and and we've got a few minutes left so you know please feel free to post a couple more questions but one of the questions i had was um and we talked about it a little bit when we spoke last week but um are you noticing any uh you know, emotional durability from this new production. I mean, people definitely associate genes with um, physical durability, lasting a long time and, and wearing well with time. But uh, is there any particular aspect of emotional connection with a garment that you're noticing in your particular product? Yeah, absolutely. It's it, pretty rare these days for people to have a product made just for them, for it to not exist, and then for them to purchase it and then it be made. So people absolutely are like they they feel a stronger connection to their to their products. Um, since we've only been around three years now, there haven't been a lot of uh, you know like crazy amounts of wear and tear on the product. But for for people who are wearing these every day, and there are definitely those people out there, they come back to us because we have a free repair policy, like through, through your lifetime, we want you these to be through your lifetime, the, the lifetime of the pants, we want these to be your favorite. So bring them in and, and we will, we will fix them up. And yeah, there are a lot of people who take advantage of this. Um, Cause it's exciting to, to have something that you feel like just really suits you. And it's like, not only does it just fit you, but it, it was it, like lucky enough to just fit you was made for you. So I think people appreciate that and, and want it to want it to last as long as possible. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. I have a, a series about five questions here. So let's see if I can merge a few of them. Um, but one here is about price. So a relatively high price um, for the garment. And are you do you feel that you're obligated to help educate individuals on the idea of purchasing quality rather than, you know, cheaper products and quantity that they're used to, they're trained to um, buy at the moment? Yeah, I love this question because it's, a, it's definitely something we ask ourselves a lot. We're, we're at the stage where we don't feel like we need to do that. We really want to be addressing consumers who are already there like we we have a small team we're not even 20 people um we don't have a lot of bandwidth to to go um shooting shouting from the rooftops so uh we're we're mostly addressing yeah the people who are already there but we think that we see we have seen that that trend is really changing that people are starting to notice what the impact is and and are starting to recognize that clothing used to be made in a much better way than it is now. And like with fast fashion, uh, we just got to a point where like a lot of uh, clothing brands got to a point where they would have to just keep reducing features, reducing the quality of the seams because there's no point, like people are gonna wear something three times and, and throw it out. But I think that's 
that's changing, especially with COVID, people are like sitting at home having to confront how much they have. They're starting to rethink, uh, do I really need so much stuff? And something that we've see have seen catch on and hopefully catches on in a bigger way is, is looking at things as, as cost per wear and thinking about, all right, I'm actually gonna get 500 wares out of this. I, I know it's gonna be possible. And then seeing how much that would cost per wear versus how many times are you gonna wear something that you got from Zara? I know it's, if you, if you wear it a bunch, that's great. That's really amazing. But it's often that things go out of trend and it's just not reasonable to, to think that you wear it more than a few times. Um, we are two minutes over, but I'm gonna let a few more questions um, be answered here. Um, there are two. Um, so one goes back to um, it taking 30 minutes for a scan to be shown on your own body. And the question is, um, does it take half an hour for each one or can you sort of, can you nest a couple of requests in there so that you receive them five minutes after each other? 30 minutes each, but does the, does the technology take in more styles than one? Um, in rapid succession. Yeah, I'm glad, glad I'm getting this question because I think I just need to clarify that we, ha we haven't quite built that yet. So it's not available, but when it is, uh, it will be possible to, to nest and to have those, those running. Um, it would just be a matter of us having other computers, other things running the, the, the renderings. So yes, it, it will definitely, definitely be possible. And in not even two months when you go to our website and to the app, you will be able to um, see the ch styles change. It just won't be on, on you. It will be on um, a generic model. Great. And then um, some fabric related questions and then one business question and then we'll, we'll close in about five minutes. So the, the fabric questions are, um, is Restore Tech, um, thread that you use, so it's thread-based, mm -hmm. not fabric-based, excuse me. Is it biodegradable or just recyclable? And the other one was a fabric question. Are you planning to use other fabrics? Yeah, so Resortex thread is not biodegradable from my understanding. I actually don't know. They, they're they pretty tight-lipped about what it's made from, just as an IP kind of protection thing. Um, but it, it basically will melt away. It might even evaporate um, at what is the temperature 200 ish um, so something that's like in between so you so you have an iron on it it's fine but like if you uh, and same with like putting it in the in your of course heater at home like your dry dryer but if you have it at the right industrial facility then they're able to kind of melt it away um, talking to one of their founders, Cedric, he said there's a way to like collect the material, but there's so little of it that he's like, it's almost not worth it, but we do anyway that we kind of collect it as it's melting. And then um, other fabrics, yeah, always, yeah, always looking at, at new interesting fabrics, especially, especially ones that could be recycled and could be, um, included in a, in a circular economy. The, the ones that we use right now are pretty far from, except for the ones that we've, um, well, okay, so the, the origins of the fibers that we're getting, we're extremely happy with. We, 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 both from social responsibility and from an environmental responsibility standpoint, are very happy with the fibers and where they're coming from. But like most fabrics that things are made of today, they're blends, they're really tricky to, to recycle and reuse. Um, we do have a fabric that isn't a blend. And so we're able to, that one is more recyclable, but still when you're recycling cotton, you still have to rip it up. And so the threat, the fiber length does shorten. And so the resultant or like the next fabric that it's made into is not going to be as strong. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of difficulties with recycling these days. Um, that, that would be kind of, is there, is there a type of fiber that when you do recycle it, it doesn't downgrade, it doesn't downcycle. That's like a holy grail for us. I think another holy grail would be 
natural um, or biodegradable synthetic, uh, sorry, spandex. Spandex, that's, that's better for the environment. I think that's, that's a tricky one because we originally said, no spandex, we're not gonna use that, but found that everyone wanted it. Like every single person who walked through our store, even if they said, I only buy, you know, 100% cotton. Um, I want it to be rigid. I want it to stand up when I, when I hold it up. But they still um, preferred the stretch. I think it's just like the way that that, that we've come to expect. Okay, thank you. And then finally, um, uh, the business question was: Do you have any suggestions about networking to find good partners, um, especially during COVID? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, we, I have been trying on LinkedIn to get connected with a lot of different people. We've had a lot of luck with that. Um, Angel List is another interesting place for, for the very young startups. We're not really in, as involved anymore because we're not that new of a startup, but they're really, really tiny ones. Um, there are a number of kind of sustainable fashion groups around the world and and those people are always eager to, to get connected with others. Um, something that I feel a little weird uh, mentioning, but I, I was mentioning earlier was um, this new app that is trying to connect people, uh, not necessarily through Zoom, but through just chatting on the phone called Clubhouse. And I've, I've met some people I would not, in, in any other world, I would not have met them. So I think, people have gotten creative with with COVID and how how they can um, meet each other and it actually might be more efficient these days because there are so many people kind of funneling through through the same platforms um, eager to to have that human connection again. Well, thank you, Beth. I think we will close it there. And I just want to end with just a little insight that I got from Beth when we spoke last week in preparation for this. And one of the things that she said to me was that, um, that she gets bored easily. And she really questioned, why would I make another t-shirt? Why, why would I design another t-shirt? And she saw an opportunity or she sees an opportunity and then is not able to unsee it. And so in seeing this opportunity in the fashion industry and really considering sustainability and um, identity as core values, she's really pursuing it and she's bushwhacking. She's creating her own um, career path and it's incredibly um, inspiring and it's what we encourage our students to do. So thank you for seeing an opportunity and not being able to unsee it. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Very Thank inspiring you. talk. And just to remind everyone, if, if you're interested in connecting or um, hearing more about this app that's being launched in two weeks, please send me an email. We're, we're, we're looking for, for beta testers. And I imagine that you would all have some really great feedback for us. Thank you everybody for joining us and uh, please join us for our future events and lectures and um, good night. Thanks for spending this evening with us. <laughs>